Well, it seems appropriate to start with the basics, and your analysis is certainly the basic tool of our subspecialty. So I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes talking about your analysis and hopefully give some practical pearls and pitfalls and learn more about uh, how we consider your analysis today. The, quote, routine your analysis is one of our best non-invasive diagnostic tools. It allows us to find diseases that may otherwise go unnoticed. Some of those are kidney diseases like glomerulonephritis, and we may not have any idea there's anything going on until there's a screening urinalysis for a school physical or a camp physical or an athletic physical that shows hematuria and proteinuria. Sometimes we only know that there's going to be renal failure there because your analysis shows proteinuria and we get a subsequent set of chemistry labs and find out that the kidneys aren't working. The same is true of hypertensive nephropathy. We might not know it's there until we see the protein in the urine. And of course, the urine is a great screen for undetected diabetes mellitus. The other nice thing about the urinalysis is it's something that can easily be done in the office. It does require a few tools. First of all, you have to have some collection devices, and those include, for the pediatrician, a variety of containers. You have to have containers for the older kids and a good supply of bags for the younger kids, and you need uh, mild antiseptics to clean off to get a clean catch midstream. There are occasions when you need to do an in-and-out cath, and there are a nice number of prepackaged kits that allow you to do that easily, and they're not that expensive. If you're going to do urinalysis in the office, you need a refrigerator because you're going to need to store the urine samples there unless you're willing to look at every one of them uh, completely freshly within an hour. And then you need dipsticks, and the dipsticks come in a variety of sizes and a variety of numbers on the dipstick. And these days, you also need to have controls to be sure your dipsticks have not uh, gone out of function. And then, if you're only going to do those things, that's fine, but you may want to do a microscopic exam, and that requires a little bit more um, uh, equipment and may not be necessary if you're just, just using the urinalysis as a screening tool. If you're going to do a microscopic exam, you're going to have to have some real equipment, a centrifuge and the supplies to uh, put the urine in to spin it. You're going to need slides and cover slips. And, of course, you're going to need a microscope. It doesn't have to be elaborate as this one. It can be a basic, simple microscope. Now, the key to really having a good urinalysis result is having a good urinalysis collection of the specimen. And that means that you really ought to get a freshly voided specimen. And that's very easy for me to say, but very hard to get in some pediatric patients, especially the younger kids who really don't want to void on command. The voided specimen is best because there are formed elements um, that may be important that you're not going to be able to see if the specimen has uh, been sitting around for a while, especially if the pH is greater than 7 or the specific gravity is less than 1.015. Furthermore, if there's any bacterial contamination in that specimen, the bacteria tends to overgrow at room temperature. And that can metabolize any glucose present to give a false negative diabetic screen, it can metabolize urea to ammonia, which gives you a very high urine pH and can give you a false positive protein screen. And the bacteria can also produce peroxidases that will interfere with the blood test, and you'll get a false positive blood test. So the pearl here is get a new sample if the specimen is at room temp temperature for longer than an hour or in the refrigerator for more than four hours. Now, the best sample to get is a clean catch midstream. It's really the method of choice even for a routine urinalysis because it avoids contamination with uh, elements outside the bladder and the urinary tract. And those can be skin cells, vaginal cells, bacteria, or protein-containing secretions. This sample can also be used for bacterial culture, so if you actually uh, have a child with a fever and you get a urinalysis, you can use that for a culture if you need to as well, and sometimes it's very difficult to get the second sample. It also saves time and money for repeating samples that you have false positives in for some of the things on the screening test. In order to obtain the sample, you need to cleanse the external genitalia with a mild antiseptic. You need to discard the first portion of the void and collect the mid portion, and this should be done 
while the urine is still going on. It should not start and stop the stream. My husband is a urinalysis, and his pearl to all his patients who are adults uh, is, uh, my husband is a urologist, and his pearl, <laughs> I just replayed that in my head, and it didn't come out right. My husband's a urologist, and he tells all his adult patients that if your hand didn't get wet, you didn't do it right. Now, that leads to one of the pitfalls for us, because uh, especially in adolescent girls or any uh, obese uh, girls or boys, uh, it's a problem to get a good sample. And the obese uh, adolescent girls, the labia really has to be spread apart for the clean collection. And most adolescent girls won't or don't do this. Now, specimen collection is also a problem for infants and toddlers. It's very difficult to get a clean catch midstream because they just won't go most of the time. And squeezing diapers is not acceptable. <laughs> so we're often reduced to a bag specimen, which is actually not a bad thing for screening. It's just a bad thing if you want to use it for a culture. Uh, when you need a culture, if you have a uncircumcised young boy, one you can't retract the foreskin in, or newborn infants, you really need to do a suprapubic tap. When you do that, you may get a contamination with blood from actually doing the needle stick, so you can't believe the blood on that specimen. And sometimes it's useful to do an in and out cath, especially for a culture and urinalysis for toddler girls who just won't go. The kids who are between the ages of 18 months and four years who are in toilet training really have a problem giving you a sample because they know they're not supposed to go in strange places and strange containers, and they just don't want to do it. Now, if you're looking for cells or nitrites, it's best to get a first morning urine, but that has to be collected at home when you first arise in the morning. That is the most concentrated. It may be inadequate, though, for cells and casts, so you really need to do a fresh specimen for that in the office. Often when you refrigerate that for transport to the center, and it should be refrigerated because bacteria will overgrow and give you all those false positives. When that happens, sometimes the urine turns cloudy from crystal pre precipitation, which scares everybody, but you just rewarm it to room temperature and the urine clears up. In and out catheterization is not routine, but it is certainly useful when you need a urine from a patient who cannot and will not void, and in an adolescent female who cannot or will not do a clean catch. Now, for the routine urinalysis, we do three kinds of exams, a gross exam, a dipstick exam, and a microscopic exam. And I'm going to talk a little in detail about all of those. First thing I want to talk about is the gross appearance, and most of us skip that line on the written urinalysis sheet, but it's often very helpful. We can look at color and turbidity, and in the old days, before there were dipsticks, odor was very important because sometimes that's the only way you could tell the difference in uh, a urinary tract infection and not. The color of the urine is very important to us. The normal color is various shades of yellow, as shown in this picture. And it's everything from a more amber to a lighter yellow. If the urine is amber to reddish brown, you need to suspect red cells in the urine, hemoglobin, myoglobin, or hemosiderin. If the color is bright red, that means fresh blood, and you're more likely to have an, a traumatic injury, uh, a lesion that's bleeding in the bladder or in the kidney. Or in the case of infant diapers, uh, urates are pink, and they may make you think you have uh, red urine, but it's really just urates. Other things that can give you a bright red color that we see often, we don't see porphyrins or peridium. What we usually see is food coloring and beets, and that makes everybody very nervous. Very infrequently, you'll see a brown or black urine. And the only time I have seen it has been with infant diapers and infants that I had with hypertension who were taking the drug methyl dopa. And then when the diaper was exposed to air, the methyl dopa excreted metabolites turned black, and that does give everybody a bad scare. Bright orange is the color of urine in patients who are taking rifampin. And dark orange is the color of urine and kids who eat too many carrots or who have high bilirubin. 
Blue-green urine can be seen if you're getting, bilir- uh, getting methylene blue. And uh, that, in some of the, the uh, medicines used for uh, anesthetizing the urinary tract from, for pain from urinary tract I- infection, it contains methylene blue and it will turn the urine uh, blue. And the main culprit is a, a drug called Uracid. Now, it's also important to look at the turbidity of the urine, and I hope you can tell here that one of these is cloudy and one of these is clear. The normal is to be clear. When you have a cloudy urine, you can have all kinds of things. It could be bacteria, it could be leukocytes, or it could just be crystals. As I said before, urine that's in the refrigerator may turn cloudy because of the precipitation of crystals. If that's the case, recentrifuging the urine, acidifying it, or rewarming it to room temperature will clear the urine. It will not clear a urine full of white cells and bacteria. When there are crystals, most of the time it's the amorphous crystals that precipitate out and give this cloudy color. And if it's an alkaline urine, that's going to be phosphates, or if it's an acid urine, it's going to be urates. A hazy urine also is one, it often is one that has a lot of mucus in it, and the mucus can be from vaginal secretions, can be from mucus threads in the urine. Um, we see a variety of children who have bladder augmentations with intestinal cells that produce mucus, and we see a lot, sometimes thick mucus plugs in those urines. Uh, it's rare for us to see a milky urine, but if there are a lot of fat globules in the urine, you will see a milky color, and uh, that's probably only going to be seen in our population in someone with very severe nephrotic syndrome that's uncontrolled and they have high cholesterol and a lot of oval fat bodies in their urine. The most common thing we see is a smoky colored urine. It's usually red brown and it's full of red blood cells. I mentioned the odor here because most of us uh, don't uh, get that information. It's not reported on the routine anymore, but it does give valuable, valuable information for common and rare conditions. And most notably, a foul-smelling, ammonia-smelling urine has either bacterial contamination or a lot of bacteria from an infection. Um, A fruity urine uh, is usually full of ketones, and that can be uh, from diabetes with ketoacidosis or from really severe starvation. Um, If you have any kids on the uh, Adkins diet, they might have a fruity-smelling urine. And then for rare diseases, a urine that smells like maple syrup is maple syrup urine disease, very cleverly named. Musty urine can be seen in patients with phenylketonuria. And sometimes ingested foods give odd odors, and probably the one we all know the best is asparagus. And there are also certain excreted drugs that give an unusual odor, and some of the antibiotics do that. Well, I can move now on to talk about the dipstick. This is the best... uh, Bang for your buck. Uh, You can get a lot of information in a two-minute period. You need to read it by the times that are on the dipstick uh, that you're using. So if it says glucose 30 seconds, you need to have a watch with a second hand, and you need to be reading that at 30 seconds. If you don't read it at 30 seconds, it may turn a very positive color and give you a false positive. You need to read ketones at 40 seconds. You need to read the specific gravity at 45 seconds. And at 60 seconds, you need to multitask. You need to do pH, protein, blood, and urobilinogen. You also do nitrates at 60 seconds, but you don't do leukocytes until two minutes. And it's important to wait for those times to get accurate results. If you're going to get accurate and useful information from the dipstick, you need to use a fresh, well-mixed, unspun urine sample. The dipstick bottle that you're using should be kept closed and dry and out of the sun and at a reasonable room temperature, not a Houston summer room temperature. And it should be used within its expiration date. It's very important that you not remove the desiccant from the bottle or the dipstick pads will lose their uh, accuracy. And then you need to do quality control with a new bottle and periodically if you keep a bottle around for many days or many weeks. Those kind of quality control pads can be bought at the same places that you buy the dipstick um, uh, supplies. Now, what can you learn from what's on the dipstick? Well, the urine pH 
has a very widely normal range, anything from 4.5 to 8.5, and the actual dipstick reads 5 to 8. If the pH is greater than 7.5, that's not really very normal, and we only usually see that in someone who's taking bicarbonate or alkali supplements. If the pH is 8 or higher, you have to suspect that there are urea-splitting bacteria present in the urine, either as contaminants or with a urinary tract infection, and giving you a really falsely high uh, pH because of the uh, uh, creation of ammonia in that sample. If the patient has uh, systemic acidosis and the urine pH is greater than 6, you have to worry about renal tubular acidosis. The pearl for the pH is that the pH determines what kind of amorphous crystals you might have. And if it's an acid pH, it'll be urates. And if it's an alkaline pH, it will be phosphates. One pitfall of the pH dipstick is that if you have ex excess urine on the dipstick, the urine will run over uh, from the protein reagent and will falsely lower your pH result. And so you have to be very careful how much urine you put on the dipstick sample. The urine-specific gravity is very helpful to us. It's a guide to urine concentration. But one pitfall you have to avoid is thinking that the specific gravity can tell you about concentration, urine concentration, and um, about the ability of the kidney to concentrate in dehydration and tell you something about the state of hydration of the patient if the patient has renal failure or some disease that causes you to lose concentrating ability. You can feel falsely secure when the specific gravity is 1010 on a dehydrated child with renal failure because they just can't concentrate the urine anymore. The urine-specific gravity dipstick estimates the osmolality, but it's not the same measurement. Um, and it's close enough that helps you with a, a variety of other conditions that you'd like to estimate the osmolality. Um, the only uh, proviso is that the specific gravity is falsely increased uh, in, above the osmolality in the presence of increased protein. And since I see a lot of patients with increased protein, I have to look at the specific gravity with a grain of salt, if you will. The dipstick method, however, is not affected by glucose, x-ray contrast, as the re old refractometer that we used to use for this purpose. The dipstick specific gravity reading is from 1.000 to 1.030, and it correlates very well with the refractometer, which is a very accurate way to do specific gravity, but requires a lot more equipment and skill. And um, it's not quite as high, uh, not quite as accurate in the high pH range. Just a few words about the urine protein. The dipstick is more sensitive to albumin than other forms of protein that appear in the urine, uh, globulins, mucoproteins, and Bench Jones proteins, which is very good for what we do because most of our patients were looking for albumin. Anytime you see protein of one plus or more in the urine, that's significant. And if the specific gravity is really low, even trace might be uh, uh, significant in some conditions. But it's important to remember that sometimes you're getting the urinalysis at a time the child is sick. And so you're going to get transient proteinuria often in the presence of fever, stress, or exercise, or uh, congestive heart failure, which we don't see very often. So if you get a positive in one of those circumstances, just repeat the urine when the child is well before you start working them up for renal disease. There are a variety of things that can give you a false positive for protein, and they include some of the things we use in the antiseptics to clean the, off for the clean catch specimens. You need to be careful that these are not in the antiseptic that you use. The most common problem we see in our adolescent patients is vaginal or prostatic secretions in kids that don't clean off very well, and that may give us a higher uh, protein when we don't expect protein. Blood on the dipstick usually detects a very small amount of blood, three to four red cells per high-powered field, and it can also uh, detect hemoglobin or myoglobin without the presence of intact red cells. So you need a microscopic exam to distinguish those things. There are a variety of cases that you have decreased reactivity or false positives, and those are in the handout. The urine glucose and, and ketones are important to remember that in the glucose, uh, the test is specific for glucose and not for other sugars, so that if you want to screen for other sugars, you must do a clinitest. 
And and the key for the ketones is that the dipstick really reacts just with acetoacetic acid and not with acetone or beta-hydroxybutyrate, so it may not give you a completely accurate assessment of what's going on. I want to move on and talk just a little bit about uh, urobilinogen, which is that thing on the dipstick that we nephrologists like to ignore and that many people do ignore. Uh, And the question is, what does it mean when it comes up positive? Well, urobilinogen is usually made in the intestine from bilirubin. It's excreted primarily in the stool, but less than 5% is excreted in the urine, and the urobilinogen dipstick is very sensitive for that. So it's normal to see trace amounts of urobilinogen in the dipstick, uh, in the urine. And that means you'll see a 0.2 to 1 milligram per deciliter reading. So if you see anything up to 1, don't worry about it. Just ignore it and move on. It's when it's 2 or above that you need to think there might be something there. And an abnormally high urobilinogen in the urine is usually found in our population in the presence of hemolytic anemia or in the presence of intestinal obstruction. The absence of urobilinogen on the dipstick does not mean there isn't any urobilinogen because urobilinogen is very sensitive to the air. and Once it's exposed, it's converted to other metabolites that don't react with the dipstick. Well, now I want to go on in the last few minutes of this talk and talk about the microscopic exam. The first thing you have to do for the microscopic is prepare the sediment well. You need to start with 10 milliliters of well-mixed fresh urine. It should be in a conical tube. It should be centrifuged between 2,000 and 3,000 for five minutes. And once you've decided what your tabletop centrifuge uh, level uh, is closest to in that 2,000 to 3,000 range, you should stay there forever. You should not be trying to go back and forth at different levels. So you know, have some consistency in your reading. Once you have centrifuged it for five minutes, then you discard all but about uh, 0.5 to 1 milliliter. Resuspend the, the, the sediment, transfer it to a glass slide, cover it with a cover slip, and then be sure to look at it under a microscope where you've t- put the condenser way down and turned the light down so that you have the best contrast to see what you're going to see. And here's the variety of things you can see with a microscopic exam. But one picture or several pictures may be worth a thousand words, so let's go to the pictures. These are what red blood cells actually look like when you're looking through low power. There's no way you can tell those are red blood cells. You can only tell there are a lot of cells there, so you must go to high power to see that these are red blood cells. These are normal. If you see those that are what we call dysmorphic looking, those that have come in funny shapes and are all varied, they're more likely to be from glomerular disease than from some other source. And I had a very difficult time trying to find any pictures of those. The uh, red blood cells can be confused with other things on the slide. Uh, If you weren't noticing very carefully, you might think that oxalate crystals at low power were red cells. But I think you can see if you look closely that these have sort of a cross in them and they're actually double pyramids. And even yeast, especially budding yeast, can look like red cells. This is at high power, and this looks like a red cell on its side, where it gives you that sort of biconcave disc look. The thing to remember when looking at white cells on the urine is that not all white cells are leukocytes, and the dipstick picks up leukocytes, but it doesn't pick up lymphocytes, renal tubular epithelial cells, macrophages, and other things that might be in the urine of of patients with with pathologic conditions. And here you can see the difference between uh, what a renal tubular cell looks like and what white cells look like. You can also see a variety of epithelial cells, and these are transitional bladder epithelial cells. They look similar to the renal tubular epithelial cells, and here are a variety of squamous cells, usually from vaginal uh, source in most of our patients, although you can see a variety of squamous cells from the foreskin area uh, in uncircumcised males and just uh, from skin in in any patient that you're getting a urine on. This is a very specialized cell that we see in nephrotic syndrome patients, and it's a renal tubular cell that's loaded with fat globules, and so we call it an oval fat body. When you see it, it means you've got nephrotic syndrome, and this is that same thing under polarized light. 
Now, the microscopic exam is also very good for casts, and casts are molded in the renal tubules under a variety of circumstances, which are shown in your handout. Um, the place to look for casts on the sample is at the edge of the cover slip, and it's important to note that some casts in the urine are normal. Hyaline and, and granular casts are a normal variant, and you see it in normal patients, and you shouldn't worry about it. If you see more than five to ten hyaline casts per high powered field or low power sorry, per low powered field, you have to worry that you have a condition of heavy proteinuria. Waxy and broadcasts are only seen in those patients that have severe renal disease and usually have renal failure. Here are the common casts that we see, the granular cast, and this hyaline cast you can barely see, and I call that the ghost of a cast. This is a red blood cell cast, and you can see the individual red blood cells in it, and that's to be distinguished from a myoglobin cast or a hemoglobin cast in which you see just the pigmented substance without the cells. This is a white blood cell cast with white blood cells in it, and this is a waxy cast. And finally, uh, or in, uh, almost coming to a close, you can also see bacteria on the urine. And the pearl here is that if you see even a few bacteria on an unspun urine, you probably have a urinary tract infection. But if you see a few on a spun urine, don't worry about it. It need, means nothing. It's probably just contamination. This is a sample of a spun urine, and it's got tons of rods in it, and this is someone who had a urinary tract infection. You can also see unusual microbes in the urine. You can see yeast forms, and most often we see these in kids who have a concomitant diaper rash and we have a bag specimen. And many times I've diagnosed pinworms by seeing pinworm eggs in the urinalysis samples in our clinics, and this is a typical appearance. And finally, I just want to show that there are different kinds of crystals you usually should have a reference to look at in your office so you know which crystals are which. And the most important things are to remember that crystals often appear after the urine stands for a while, that most of the crystals are of no clinical significance, and that the few pathologic crystals that we see, we don't see very often in pediatric population. Here are the crystals we see the most. This is an acid urine and the various forms of urate. I probably see these every week in my clinic. I occasionally see these rhomboid forms. I occasionally see these little spicule forms. I almost never see those uh, uh, sort of uh, sea urchin looking forms. We see a lot of oxalate crystals in the urine, especially people who drink a lot of iced tea, and it doesn't mean anything. It's not even very helpful for predicting calcium oxalate stones. Cysteine crystals are very distinctive, very rare, almost never seen in pediatric patients except uh, that rare teenager who gets diagnosed with cystinuria. The alkaline pH crystals that we see a lot of are the phosphate crystals. We see amorphous crystals, we see the calcium phosphorus spicules, and we see a lot of these sort of envelope looking uh, crystal shapes of the triple phosphates. And we see those every week in, in clinic. And finally, we see lots of artifacts in the urine, the most common being this fiber. And that fiber comes from the gauze we used to, to have the patients clean off with. And if you don't know, you might want to call that a cast, but I think you can see a granular cast here, and it's totally different looking from this fiber. Starch crystals that used to be seen a lot when people used cornstarch for babies' diapers, we see mostly talcum powder now, which looks a little bit different than this. And you can also be confused by an air bubble in the urine, which makes you think you have something awful, some crystal, and it really is nothing but air in the urine. And I just want to leave you with the thought that urine is beautiful, and hopefully that will set the tone for the rest of this afternoon's presentation.